All right, so as uh, Anne already mentioned, uh, this is the third one in our Sparkly R series. And um, we, we are gonna be covering uh, different topics uh, for this webinar. Uh, first of all, we're gonna start us uh, with an overview as we always do, and we're gonna close up with questions. Uh, but really we're gonna cover three topics in the webinar. Uh, the first one is um, about um, scaling R with a new uh, Sparkly R function that we introduced in Sparkly R06 called Spark Apply. Um, Edgar, already on the first webinar, he gave us an intro to this, um, this function. We're gonna get uh, into the details of how it works uh, in, in, a, in a more deeper way. Uh, second topic, we're gonna briefly discuss uh, Livy, which is a service um, that can run together with uh, Apache Spark uh, to make us um, be able to connect from our desktop environments to Livy and Spark services. And the last uh, topic that we're gonna uh, consider today is uh, building applications that use Spark with Shiny and Sparkly R. With that, let's, let's get started with the overview. Um, and as I mentioned, this is the third in the series of webinars. If you are starting with this webinar, I highly recommend you that um, you also um, take the intro webinar. Um, I'm not gonna cover everything, but if this is your first uh, webinar in the, in the series that you're uh, starting with, all, all, all you need to know is that uh, Apache Spark is a cluster computing environment. Um, it's independent from storage, so um, definitely you can have your data in, in, different, in different data sources that uh, Spark will enable you to compute against. And uh, Sparkly R is the topic of this webinar, which is a R package. It's just an R package like any other package in the CRAN um, ecosystem. And uh, it enables basically connecting us from R into Apache Spark. Um, on, the, on the second webinar, we briefly discussed uh, how to create extensions. We went over how to use, um, uh, first of all, how to use extensions, how to use R code to extend Sparkly R into other functionality that is not uh, core from the package. Um, we also took a look at writing Scala code um, to really take advantage of 100% of the functionality available in Spark. And finally, uh, creating our packages that can as well be published to the CRAN repo. And uh, definitely another, another interesting series if you're looking um, into topics like using H2O uh, graphics or um, connecting to multiple data sources. Now for this uh, webinar, we're gonna focus mostly on Spark and uh, Sparkly R, but we're gonna take a look at one data set that is um, a little bit more interesting than what we've been doing. Um, in, in that we did on the previous webinar. Um, this data set, um, it's called the Common Crawl uh, Project, and is basically a um, um, source of web pages that um, this organization has already provided. It's a pretty big data set uh, where, and um, in, in order to be able to uh, extract information out of this data set, uh, what we really need to take into consideration is how to scale uh, our computations to be able to access the data and both process it. So we're, we're gonna be talking um, uh, in detail about this. And we're also gonna uh, mention that we're gonna talk about Livy uh, as a way of uh, connecting to um, a, a Spark from your desktop computers. And last but not least, uh, how do we build Shiny applications uh, using Sparkly R? And again, since Sparkly R is an R package, you can use Sparkly R with any of the other existing uh, packages in, in the R community. And using Shiny is uh, definitely a good match, but you can also consider using, for instance, Sparkly R with R Markdown and other packages to uh, really uh, create a compelling uh, use cases while using Apache Spark with, with R. So first topic, uh, scaling R. Uh, first of all, um, I want to mention kind of like what is the motivation for using R, directly R, uh, while you're scaling your computations, right? Um, so, you know, uh, you're always using R code while working with Sparkly R through tools like um, Deplier or um, the ML lib wrappers that Sparkly R supports. 
Uh, but there's cases where you might want to use the actual R code running at scale on your cluster. So um, there's there's kind of like two use cases that I currently um, um, see on uh, for for Spark Apply. So the first one is um, the example that we have on the top, and uh, really what it what it's talking about here is uh, you know uh, a lot of you are experts on R, and um, it's what Spark Apply provides is a way of leveraging our current skills with R um, in, in in Spark. So for instance. Uh, suppose that we have the iris table, and uh, we want to we want to push uh, we want to change the table to uh, contain some jitter. And you know, if if you're familiar with R, uh, you might be also familiar with the jitter uh, function. Now, there's there's a way of doing this um, in in Spark, I'm sure, uh, but you know, like on top of our heads, might not really remember what ex what is exactly the function signature. Etc. Right? We're just familiar with R, and we want to use the tools that we know and love. Uh, so in this case, uh, what we can do is um, run over the Iris uh, Spark table that we previously um, copied into Spark. Uh, we can run um, Spark Apply with a custom function. And what is important here to notice is that on the right side, the S Apply uh, from uh, that that is applying the jitter function over each column. Uh, this is this is our code, right? Uh, this is code code that we're familiar with, and it's our code that is executing across across the cluster. So very easy, uh, kind of like entry point to reuse the skills that we already know um, in our. And the other, um, the second use case is basically as a way to complement R. Uh, by this, what I mean is that uh, Spark is a rich ecosystem where you can do a lot of things, uh, but there is still um, a lot of Packages on the R community that um, provide a lot of value, right? And uh, and for instance, uh, one case is that uh, at times you might want to run a linear model, uh, a linear regression uh, over um, over Spark and MLE or H2O might be just what you need. In some other cases, you might want um, to use the actual linear regression for um, a subset of the data that um, that would match better the or the expectations that you have from from the model that is created uh, so for that that particular case you can act uh, you can also use the spark apply uh, in this case we're using um, the broom package to tidy the linear model that um, uh, we're creating uh, but the linear linear model that is uh, being executed it's exactly um, the same linear model that you would run in R. Uh, it just happens to be the case that uh, is being executed over um, uh, a data set that it's large enough that it's worth uh, splitting into smaller pieces. So we're um, running a group by query here uh, over the species, which means that basically um, we're asking Spark to split the data set into groups by species. Um, something worth noting um, in this in, in in the concept of spark apply is that the function that you provide it's gonna uh, it's gonna uh, the the parameter that it gets which is is a data frame and the result of this function um, that spark apply expects should be also a data frame um, I've, I've definitely got uh, we definitely got a bunch of questions of like hey spark apply is not working appropriately and a lot of them were uh, mostly related with uh, not not returning the correct correct data type, which is should be should be a data frame um, uh, from all the functions that you write on Spark Apply. So th those are our, our two main uh, use cases. And um, what uh, what I want to talk a little bit uh, is give you an overview of how uh, Spark Apply actually works. So this diagram shows. Um, how your Spark cluster probably looks like today. Um, if you're already a Sparkly R user and uh, R user, uh, what you should probably, what you're probably doing today is you have um, um, a machine which is usually your gateway into the cluster uh, that might also be the, the master node of for this cluster that basically has R, the R runtime installed and um, where you are already using Sparkly R and, uh, and several other packages from this machine. It is usually the case that R Studio or Shiny, Shiny Server would be in installed on, on this machine. So, um, you know, uh, kind of like this, this, is, this, this should be a, 
a diagram that looks familiar to you uh, with um, with that that you use on your on, on your day to day. Um, so the, the first important thing to understand for Spark Apply is that it requires a change in your cluster. And um, by, by this, what I mean is that um, you, well, it, it is uh, the, your responsibility, uh, Sparkly R won't help you with this particular step, uh, to install R on each uh, worker node. This, this is usually a pretty straightforward step. Um, there's usually, you know, uh, in, my, in, in my demo, for instance, I provisioned this, um, my cluster with script. And basically, I just had to add one more line to say, hey, when you're provisioning this cluster, make sure that R is installed in each worker node. Um, but it's important to notice because um, if, if you have a cluster that looks more like this, you won't be able to use Spark Apply. Um, it is the case that you will be able to use any of the Sparkly R functionality uh, that you already know and are familiar with. Um, but if you want to use Spark Apply, you need to get R installed on each worker node. And this really depends on uh, each different different clusters, um, you know, require different ways of um, installing uh, R on, on each in each node. Uh, service providers like, for instance, Databricks uh, already support um, you know, uh, execution of R code across their clusters. So you wouldn't you wouldn't have to uh, to worry about this. So um, the next step is okay. What happens when we actually run Spark Apply? So you would you would run Spark Apply from our Studio, and uh, in this case we're running the same um, the same function that we um, that we looked at, uh, which is just using J Jitter to add some noise into our data set. And what happens there is on the first call, um, well, the the first time that a worker node needs to make use of um, this. Uh, distributed uh, functionality. Uh, what Sparkly R uh, with Spark are going to do is they're going to um, deploy all your packages that you're currently using to each worker node. Uh, so just to be clear here, you don't need to ask your system administrators to manage packages while you're using Spark Apply. Um, Spark Apply will do that for you while you're uh, executing, in this case, um, you know, uh, pretty small closure. Uh, would uh, basically deploy all those packages for you to each each worker node. It does take a little bit of time. We'll we'll see an example of this. Um, it depends on your cluster, but um, it's 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 not bad, and you get basically all the functionality, the rich functionality that you would expect to use uh, in R on each each of the worker nodes. And then, um, well, last but again not least, um, your code is going to be executing over each worker node. So in, in this case, again, is the jitter function. What each uh, worker node is going to get is uh, this this code with a subset of the data set. Um, the way uh, Spark works is based on RDD partitions. So um, whenever you get a partition um, that is basically a set of rows on your data set, um, we are going to apply the function that you give us through Sparkly R in each in each node, and then uh, Spark will collect the results and put them back all together for you. So in general, this kind of like covers how um, Spark uh, Spark Apply works. And uh, definitely, if you have questions, uh, please uh, write them down, and we'll we'll address them. Um, the next the next part that I want to touch base on is taking a look at a real world uh, example of using uh, Spark Apply uh, with a decent data set, right? And uh, I mentioned at the beginning of this webinar that. Uh, the common crawl is a very interesting project because basically it's uh, what it does it it is it, it downloads uh, a lot of uh, web pages into a common data store so you could potentially do this uh, same exercise with a web scraper but it would take a really long time right because you need to do the work of actually retrieving each web page by yourself and that 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 takes even more resources and uh, adds much more complexity so instead what we can do is use this data set which is called uh, the common crawl uh, for for this particular demo, I, uh, I, I I wrote a library called SparkWark um, that basically reads these files called uh, Work files, and uh, that's that's the type of file that is stored in this um, in this project. Uh, to my knowledge, there's no parser of Work files on on Spark, and um, the file itself. It doesn't map well to existing file formats. It's not, you know, it's not that we can use like a CSV reader or things alike. 
Uh, I'm sure that you can hack your way into using existing tools as well. Uh, but it it was like a interesting um, data set and also file format to consider um, to doing our own parsing because there's there's always going to be edge cases where you have to write your um, your own uh, extensions in order to process data that is uh, domain specific. Um, so this library Spark Work uses uh, two interesting features. One is Spark Apply. And the other one in this case, uh, we can use any package. So the package that I chose to parse these files is RCPP. And it's interesting because obviously RCPP brings a lot of power, computation power and it's very, very efficient. And um, you can see here the code. Um, we won't get into the details. You can, you can, you can take a look at uh, the GitHub repo if you're interested. But it's, it's not that much. It's, a, it's less than 100 lines of uh, RCPP code. And then um, the helper function that parses, uh, well, that uh, that provides this functionality for R is also not that big. So, um, you know, definitely, definitely for those of you that have a particular parsing, um, uh, the need to parse files is is something worth worth considering. So I'm going to switch to this cluster. Um, this is a cluster that I literally provisioned a couple hours ago. I saved us a little bit of time by. Uh, you know, starting the cluster before this webinar, um, you can see that there is about 50 nodes um, in this this cluster. So definitely uh, gives us some uh, good sense of how this works at scale. And um, you know, uh, what what I the way that I set up this cluster was basically uh, following the di diagram that we saw on the um, couple slides ago on, on on this webinar, right? Where I um, basically you have R Studio installed in one of these. Um, uh, in, in the in the master node, and uh, that's where I'm going to do all all my day to day uh, work as I'm analyzing data. Um, yeah, so um, the first interesting thing to do here is um, to uh, connect. So I already run these lines for us, and basically the interesting thing here is that uh, since we're using uh, Yarn client mode, we want to connect as Yarn client. Um, Sometimes for demos, we use master equals local because um, get helps us get faster up and running. But in this case, definitely we wanted to uh, take advantage of um, the cluster. Uh, then the next interesting thing is um, basically um, I, uh, we're gonna we're gonna see the result of uh, executing a very simple function across the cluster. As I mentioned, this cluster has 50 nodes, and each node has uh, eight CPUs. So I wanted to take full advantage of this, and I executed this line. If we go back, uh, if we go to the Spark UI, um, what um, first first of all, what is worth noting is that uh, you know uh, you should see all your worker nodes um, in, in this this cluster. And then the interesting uh, thing here is that uh, the first um, Spark apply call that we run, uh, it was this one number zero. Uh, you can see that it actually took 1.3 minutes. Uh, it took 1.3 minutes, even though the function is pretty simple. It's just counting the rows. And this is the one-time cost that I was mentioning that uh, Spark Apply um, requires uh, well, as you start processing data in your cluster. Um, basically, what uh, you would see here when we zoom in is that um, a lot of the time in, for this particular job was um, spent on task deserialization time. This is basically um, Spark using copying all the uh, all the uh, all your package package dependencies in a distributed way across all the nodes, and you can see that for the most part this is this is a parallel process and it runs it runs pretty fast for the amount of machines that we have. Uh, if we were if we were to run this one more time, um, um, so we're again running this again uh, on the cluster. And you can see that it's pretty fast. Uh, probably took about two seconds, yep. Uh, and mostly since it, uh, since the cluster has already been initialized, you can make full use of your um, uh, packages without without any any uh, any overhead anymore. All right, so <clears throat> um, the next the next uh, call that I run uh, is basically reading uh, reading data from uh, the common crawl project. And in this case, uh, since um, we have 50 times eight, we have 400 nodes. We were able to read uh, 400 files from this project. Each file has about uh, three gigabytes. Um, 
So we're about, uh, we read about um, 1.2 terabytes of data. And you can see the result of this job here. Uh, basically, um, it, uh, it took about 6.6 .6 minutes to read uh, these 1.2 terabytes. Um, it scales very nicely on number of nodes. So if you wanted to actually read the um, uh, 72 terabytes, I believe, from this data set, you could throw machines in and um, you know, be able to process this data. Um, yeah, and um, you kind of like to give you a sense of how an efficient um, job that is making use of your resources looks like, uh, you can take a look at you know, the graph, right, where you see that a lot of the workers are um, executing uh, 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 the job, right? So now that we have our data set loaded, what can we do? Well, uh, one of the things that we can do is um, um, count the number of tags. And um, Spark, um, the Spark Work library uh, kind of like gives us um, these uh, parsing statistics by default. And we can see that uh, from all the web, page, page, web pages that we process on these 400 files, uh, we found about like 36 uh, billion tags. If we count the number of lines that we found out, uh, which uh, roughly matches uh, the number of web pages that were uh, processed, uh, we can see that well, about 10, 10 million web pages. Um, one thing to notice is that um, uh, what, I'm, what I'm interested in extracting from this data set was the keywords um, tag from HTML. So this, this, uh, for those of you that do web development, this might look very familiar. Uh, for those of you that are, uh, are not uh, familiar with web development, basically each web page in the, in, in, in the web has, well, not, it's not required, but a lot of them have a tag that helps um, uh, uh, search engines and other, other consumers of your uh, web page uh, explain what your web page is about. So you're, you're gonna see this tag on a lot of web pages. It basically says, hey, this is a meta tag, it contains keywords. And then inside it, it basically contains a comma separated list of uh, keyword values um, uh, that uh, describes the web page that you're browsing to. So what we wanna do is we wanna split this, um, this tag, uh, extract the tag and split it by commas, uh, such that we get like a nice, uh, hopefully tidy table of how these, um, um, data looks like, and uh, I'll, um, it's already it has already run. Uh, you can see here that wasn't bad, that bad uh, on performance wise, and uh, we can take a quick look at um, first of all, like how many uh, how many keywords do we have total. Uh, we had about ten million pages, and you can see that you know uh, we have about eighty five million keywords. So uh, seems to be the case that our I mean uh, there's there's roughly about Eight, uh, eight keywords per, per web page on average, right? Uh, some, something around those lines. And, um, you know, um, uh, this, this is definitely pretty interesting already um, uh, uh, results for out of, uh, you know, processing all this data. Um, what, I wanna, what I wanna mention uh, is that um, usually uh, what you wanna do when, you've, when you get to this point where uh, you have processed a significant amount of information uh, that you might want to reuse later uh, or share with colleagues and uh, with other tools. Um, you might want to write it as a file, and we're going to use this functionality um, later in this webinar. Uh, but basically what I'm doing is uh, this table of keywords that we found, we're also writing it as, uh, on disk uh, across, across the cluster as a keywords table. We can take a little uh, a look at uh, some of the keywords that we found. So for instance, if we were to look at all the web pages that contain the keyword, uh, the keyword math, and uh, we were to get, for instance, in this case, what we're doing is just getting all the pages that have that. And you know, like, um, then we're basically just getting uh, the keywords that are related to uh, pages that have the math, uh, math keyword in it. Uh, some, you know, here are some of the ones that uh, are related. Uh, this one is, uh, it's, this set is not ordered. So uh, you know, like there's definitely, you know, like uh, there's some more popular ones here, like geometry and math. Uh, definitely, uh, you would see those two keywords uh, more correlated than other ones. Uh, but yeah, uh, so um, this this kind of like completes 
uh, what, uh, what you could do on while exploring data sets with uh, Spark Apply. We're, we're definitely used, again, this data set. But uh, first, I want to talk a bit about uh, Livy. So, um, so what is Livy? Livy is a service that enables you to connect to, um, uh, to Apache Spark remotely. Um, in in our in our uh, in, in this in this in, in this cluster, we've been using R Studio directly from uh, from the cluster. So that means that you know we need to connect into the cluster or make the cluster available. Uh, you can always have uh, obviously great uh, authentication through um, R Studio into your cluster, which is a great way of setting up your cluster. In so, some other cases, you might be either limited or you might have a need to use um, uh, Spark from your desktop machine. Um, the way that you would do this is kind of like a two-step process. Uh, first, you would have to also e ask your system administrator or uh, to provide Levy in your cluster. Uh, some clusters, uh, especially provided by um, cloud providers, already support Levy. I know that at least uh, Microsoft Azure supports Levy by default in their clusters, uh, but there there might be others that provide uh, provide Levy as well by default. And if not, it can always be installed. This um, it's uh, couple lines, uh, it's basically a download of a zip file and uh, then uh, the configuration and starting up the service. Uh, once you have that ready up and running, uh, connecting is pretty straightforward. Um, I highly recommend that you set up um, uh, authentication with Livy, especially since it runs over HTTP, which is basically a website that anyone uh, you know uh, that has access to this uh, uh, cluster would be able to um, Enter right, so uh, highly highly recommended that as part of setting up Livy, you also set up authentication with Livy. Uh, but once you have that set up, you can basically uh, just run Spark Connect with the address and uh, Livy. So in this case, um, we're not going to run through through the whole um, connection, but uh, I do want to show you how this would look like um, if you're using the latest version of Sparkly R, which I also highly recommend. And um, what you could do is, um, as, as long as you're using R Studio, uh, the R Studio Preview uh, 1.1, which um, um, you can you can download from our preview site, uh, you can basically uh, set the address to your Livy service. Uh, the port is not going to be 8787. This is the port from R Studio. I believe the default is 8989 for Livy, uh, but that's something something that your uh, system administrator can can give you. Same for username and password, and you know you can you can connect and basically um, this is this is a desktop um, um, version of our studio, and you would get connection to that uh, that remote cluster as well. All right, so um, to cover our last topic in this um, webinar, uh, we're gonna we're gonna talk about Shiny and. Um, uh, well, you uh, definitely some of you are probably uh, more experts than what I am uh, on on Shiny, uh, building applications with Shiny. But uh, there's a few things that I want to cover that um, definitely um, you you want to be aware of as you build applications in Shiny that use Sparkly R. And um, this is a little bit technical, but um, again, um, you know, it's it's not that bad. Uh, what what we're looking what what, uh, what we're looking at on this diagram, right, is um, one of the functions that uh, you probably are familiar with uh, in Sparkly R called table cache. Uh, what this function does is basically creates um, uh, memory, um, uh, you know, loads into, mem into memory your uh, table as uh, persisted, as, well, as, as under storage in Sparkly R, right? Um, so uh, usually this operation takes a long time, right? Like if we, uh, when we were wor working with the uh, common crawl data set, if we were to run table cache on, on the original data set, it would basically have to read everything, right? And that would uh, take some time. So underneath the covers, what happens is um, as, as users, uh, we run table cache. Underneath the covers, Sparkly R is connecting to uh, Apache Spark uh, through a socket. And uh, this operation is synchronous, meaning that uh, it will have to wait until things complete to continue. So we run table cache. Uh, part of the operation, uh, you know, like starts triggers the caching functionality on Apache Spark. Uh, but then when we try to complete this, uh, as as this code is trying to finish complete completion, 
um, it's going to lock. And that means this is good while you're working with in a single user environment, right? Like you don't want to cache a table and you know, like then work with something that hasn't finished caching. Uh, so this is this is good behavior that we want. Um, it's basically caching, and the command is not going to finish until caching finishes, right? And in retrospect, this is this is pretty obvious. That's um, that's the way we want um, operations to work. Um, now, uh, so to to consider a couple of cases, if you have a single user using Shiny, um, you know it's it's all great, right? Um, you know whenever whenever you do an operation on Shiny on Shiny. Um, that uses Sparkly R. Uh, well, you know the operation is gonna, it it's it's got, you you're gonna get the results until that operation finishes. Uh, and you know uh, the faster the operation, obviously, the faster the results you're gonna get. Um, so let's consider that case. If you have fast applications uh, in Sparkly R and you have more than one user, um, so what is gonna happen is that when if if both users are trying to use Shiny functionality at the same time. Uh, that both use this Spark um, application. Um, basically, uh, since we are um, blocking for uh, Sparkly R operations, uh, user one will come in, do an operation. Uh, the, op as the operation takes, say, two seconds. Uh, well, the second user getting, uh, you know, working working with this application will have to wait for the first user to complete this operation. That's that's the default behavior. Um, especially when you're using a single R process. So in order to fix um, this, um, this um, you know, behavior, the, the easiest way to go is to basically assign multiple R processes to it, one R process to each user. And uh, this, is, this is functionality that is very easy to enable on our Shiny Server Pro. So definitely, um, definitely worth considering uh, while working with Sparkly R applications. Um, so once you enabled uh, one uh, R, R process per user, uh, basically, um, you know, each user is going to have their own R process. And when the second user comes and triggers the um, Spark application, uh, you, you, won't, you won't have to wait on resources except for, uh, you know, uh, if, if, if the Spark cluster is busy, right? But um, yeah, definitely, definitely worth knowing about this. Um, it's something that you want to experience while building your Shiny application, but as, uh, definitely something that you want to consider, especially when, uh, when you deploy your application. Now, um, taking, taking a look at a quick example, uh, work, transitioning an application from using, uh, from using Shiny to using Spark is actually pretty straightforward. Um, this, this, I believe, is the Hello World application that um, you, know, uh, you, you get by default when you're using Shiny and finish installing Shiny. Uh, there are a couple of things that you want to change either on the global on start function. You want to make sure that uh, you learn, uh, you load Sparkly R, and uh, you connect to your cluster. Uh, this this is a simple example. We're connecting to local, and then we're copying the faithful table, uh, the faithful table into into Spark. Uh, so that's that's part of the setup. And then the other line that I had to change to make this work with Sparkly R was uh, line twenty seven, where we actually filter. This data set instead of use instead of filtering a data frame now we, now we need in this case we're using the plier um, by pulling the wait time uh, and that's that's pretty much it the rest of the application is is exactly the same so uh, how does this look like with our um, with a cluster that we have up and running um, yeah so um, some of the first the things that you want to do is well uh, for for Testing purposes, and while you're building your application, um, you can do it directly on your on your R session. Um, if you were to deploy the application that you're building, um, you wanna you wanna you wanna follow the patterns um, that we recommend for building Shiny applications, right? So uh, you would want to deploy your actual application um, in in your Shiny server directory, and um, uh, the other the other thing to consider is if if once you deploy it, you would also need to assign permissions uh, to your to the user of your Shiny service, uh, which by default is Shiny. You would have to assign it also HDFS permissions to have access to the cluster. So uh, in this case, it's a little bit simpler because we're we're just going to run the Shiny application directly from um, from our um, uh, our interface, right? So for instance, uh, what we what we what we want to do is we want to build a small app that makes use of these uh, keywords that we have produced 
as part of crawling uh, this data set or uh, retrieving this data set. Uh, so I have a very simple text box somewhere in here. Oh, not, not that one. This is the text box. And we have a plot. And for plotting the related keywords, or um, I'm going to use the, uh, we're using the word cloud uh, package. And uh, then on, on the server, it's, it's, it's basically where I'm uh, sort of like almost copy pasting the dplyr query that we use to explore some of the keywords. Um, so let's take a look at what we're doing. So um, we're we're getting the keywords from the text box. Uh, we're splitting them. This is this has nothing to do really with um, with uh, with Sparkly R or Spark. But once we have this list of keywords, um, I'm uh, I'm we're going to run um, operation with progress, uh, saying that we're executing something under Spark, and we are going to uh, perform like a similar query where we're basically getting all the web pages. That contain that keyword, and then we're gonna join them uh, with the with the uh, same table to get the full list of keywords. Uh, we're gonna group by keyword and we're gonna count them, and then we're gonna filter. Uh, well, we're just gonna remove the keyword that we added because obviously it's contained in, in all web pages, and then we're just gonna arrange the um, the keywords uh, top to bottom to see which are the most common ones, and we're gonna get the top thousand, and then we're gonna collect the result. So we're we're only bringing one thousand rows of data um, back to um, R, and this is important because uh, you don't want to run uh, you don't want to run uh, you don't want to retrieve a significant amount of data back to your um, main node, right? Um, uh, right now we're running on fifty nodes, so it's it's definitely not possible to bring all the data back. So we need to be conscious when we plot or when we explore results to only retrieve the data that we are interested. In and that fits into the into the current uh, R process, and um, yeah, the last step is uh, to run this work cloud over over uh, over the, the data that we retrieved. Uh, work cloud would take uh, the keywords and the count. So that's that's pretty much it. So I'm, I'm going to run it locally, and um, we can we can play a little bit about with this before we go into uh, questions. All right, so. Um, this is this is our shiny application. Uh, uh, on 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 the, on behind it, it's running um, on Spark. So we're gonna see uh, here. We see that we have uh, the last job was the job twenty seven. So let's just start with something like uh, let's just search for uh, statistics. And uh, basically, what's happening under the covers is um, we're um, we should see a job running here, which already completed. It's job twenty eight. And when we back get uh, when we get back basically all the keywords associated with uh, statistics that we found in this uh, data set, it's going to zoom in a little bit. Uh, probably the things that you would expect, maybe not. I don't know. Forum probability answers help algebra, and there's definitely um, uh, some some more. Um, if um, just for fun, mostly if we were to use stats instead of statistics, uh, the keywords might be pretty different of what we find in the web. For instance, in this case, uh, NBA is one that seems to be closely correlated with stats, um, you know, and uh, fantasy, soccer player, etc. Right, scores, and uh, you know, we can we can take a look at other um, other other keywords, right? And uh, you know, um, you know, if you were to look for uh, uh, superheroes, or why not? Um, we just get a good sense of what uh, what the keywords are associated with them. Uh, books, resources, uh, Batman associated with Superman, uh, Avengers, Wonder, Da Vinci. And now the cool thing to notice here is that uh, you know we basically you know were able to get uh, get us up and running uh, in literally one hour of compute time. Um, I mean, I set up the cluster a little bit earlier, but. Um, yeah, basically, you can run these with one hour of compute time with 50 nodes. We can you can run about one, uh, 1 1.2 uh, terabytes in this case, but you can also scale it uh, for more. Um, the cost is not astronomical at all. Um, you know, it's less than the cost of going out for lunch in a lot of places. And um, uh, you can see here that we're querying querying all the well, uh, a subset of the data set that we created, which is the keywords, uh, in a pretty responsive uh, responsive way. Let's get 
Um, let's get back and close up here. So uh, we've covered Shiny and Sparkly R. Uh, so we, we have the basics of how to build these type of applications. Um, uh, interesting resources uh, for this webinar. Uh, definitely, you know, uh, we've been recommending going to spark.rstudio.com. Uh, you would find more information about Spark Apply um, in, 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 um, in this website. Um, a, a website that you're obviously familiar with if you want actually to download Shiny and you want to configure it and find the admin guide and all that uh, administration guide, uh, shiny.rstudio.com. Uh, for all Apache, Apache Levy related uh, questions uh, currently uh, and documentation, currently uh, Levy is under uh, Apache as an incubation project. Um, so you can go to levy.incubator.apache.org and read more about it and how to configure it appropri appropriately. And um, um, obviously, if you have uh, any, if you find any issues in any of these topics, or uh, you have you find find yourself with a question that hasn't been answered on Stack Overflow by the community, you can find us on GitHub on R Studio with uh, under Sparkly R. So um, that's all we have. Uh, definitely, you know, uh, we have half uh, or most of the Sparkly R team in this session. So if you have questions that are related to this webinar, or, or even if we're not, um, if time allows us, we can we can try to address as many questions as possible. And if not, uh, definitely reach us out on um, on GitHub, and we'll, we'll follow up. All right, it seems that we have, we have a few. OK, uh, let's see. Are these the right ones? I think they are. Let's see. Question about uh, Sparky R. OK, I see uh, here. I see that Javier is using LM. Does this mean we can't use normal R machine learning packages with Spark Apply instead of using, of, instead of just relying on MLLeaf? Uh, so here, here the quick answer is yes and no. Um, you know, like there's there's no automatic way of uh, parallelizing uh, uh, an algorithm that was written for um, running in a single computer to make it. To auto par uh, to make it automatically parallelizable into multiple computers, right? So, um, basically, um, the um, so even though you can run uh, machine learning on each machine, it doesn't mean necessarily that you can uh, run at scale a, a machine learning algorithm that has already been written in R. Now, there's there's interesting ways of doing this, right? For instance, in the example that we looked at. A lot of the a lot of times you don't need to run a linear model across your entire data set. You might have to run a linear model across many medium sized um, data sets, right? Like for instance, if um, if if you were to be if if you were to doing predictions per city uh, for your company, um, you can you can partition your data. Say that you have like a thousand cities. You could partition your data by city and then run any machine learning that you already are familiar with in R per city at scale across your cluster. So that would run really fast because it's running across your cluster. However, if you had to run this prediction across all your cities, right, and that this is a data set that doesn't fit, like then the answer is no. Um, there's an interesting user talk uh, that you can look, uh, read about. It's called, um, um, the title I believe is so Software Alchemy. When uh, one of our, our users explores Aggregating machine learning models that were independent, independently co computed, uh, such in with uh, especially for models that have the property where, where you can sort of average the results. And I believe in his talks he mentioned that in some cases you can do that with linear uh, linear regression, uh, where you could potentially run linear regression ac across multiple partitions and then sort of like aggregate them. But but this is like a little bit more advanced. I think I think in general the answer is no. Is no is you won't be able to automatically run these models at scale unless you partition the data, which um, it it does happen in, in a good amount of cases, but not in all. Um, have you guys tested the performance against any other packages that allows to connect to Spark? Uh, well, I mean this is this is a pretty broad question, right? Um, and yes, yeah, so we've we've done this uh, in in different um, areas. Uh, we haven't done an exhaustive performance test across every single function because that would be too time com consuming. But for instance, comparing uh, Sparkly R with Spark R on connection times, uh, we're at a par. Um, when when I run this data set, uh, I actually also I, I run the same um, I also run the same um, parsing of um, um, the Spark work files using 
uh, pure Scala code. And it was taking roughly about the same time. Um, in, in, uh, and um, yeah, so we, we take it in a in a case by case basis. So we don't have like a comprehensive, you know, perfor performance benchmarks across everything. But definitely, when uh, when something is interesting or when someone raises this question, a question for a particular function, uh, we try to take a look and uh, do do due diligence to be as fast as any other uh, any any other uh, not not just package, but also any other technology like Scala, Python, uh, while working with Spark. Um, Oh, I think hello, Peter. Question. Let's see. Uh, does anything exist, or are there plans to have a helper that will spin up Spark EMR cluster for us, giving our AWS credentials? Ah, yes, I would really like that. Uh, but it's, it's honestly not that bad. We we don't have any particular plans to do this. Uh, what I would recommend is if you search for 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 that particular question, Spark ER and EMR. And uh, there was a blog post from the Amazon AWS team. And uh, this, the script that I run is basically this script. Uh, they, they, run, they have a script um, called RStudio Sparkly R EMR 5.sh. And basically, when you provision uh, you know, in your, AW, in your uh, AWS uh, co uh, EMR console, when, when you provision this cluster, you can add a bootstrap action. Uh, in this case, I'm using my my own script because I mod modified it a bit to use the latest version of R Studio by default. Uh, but this one actually w runs pretty well. So um, yeah, but I mean, that, to answer your question is no, we don't have any any plans that I am aware of. I think it would be nice, um, but um, you know, um, the the existing the existing solution is not that bad. I mean, it's on, honestly, you know, it's copy paste and you get your cluster up and running. Uh, but yeah, it would would be nice to save us some some time. Uh, can you elaborate of why we should park it? Oh, I totally forgot uh, about mentioning that. Uh, yes, so you, you so in, in, in the demo, in, in this demo, like I actually didn't end up, you know, like reading back from Parquet. Um, what, what I would say is, uh, what I wanted to say during, uh, during our demo there is that a lot of times, uh, you know, like the cluster that you use for computing, uh, your initial, uh, you know, uh, understand, understandings of your, uh, of your data, like might be much bigger than the cluster that you need to share your data um, uh, in, in a uh, Spark, um, in a Shiny application. Uh, so what I wanted to mention there is that a lot of times what makes a lot of sense is to use a pretty big cluster for the initial computation of data. And then you can scale back the cluster with the, inf with the data that, you're, that you actually need for running your uh, uh, um, uh, Shiny application and then load it back from, uh, from Parquet. Um, sorry about that. I feel like it wasn't very clear why why we were saving it as as parquet, but um, definitely, um, you know, like it, it it makes sense to, um, you know, especially if you're gonna be disconnecting from the cluster and switching switching to uh, uh, to a, an application that is running twenty four seven. Um, you know, like you don't need the full cluster where you did your initial analysis and saving to parquet and loading it back from parquet is usually the steps that you follow or th that I you know that I would recommend following uh, for your Spark application. I don't know if I have. Uh, have the code. Uh, well, I'm, we're going to make the code available in the um, in the webinar webinar repo. But uh, here um, here here's the the part that I was mentioning. I, I didn't run this this line because basically I'm using my exis existing session. But if I were to recreate the cluster with smaller nodes and share these with my colleagues, um, the data set I believe is only uh, something like uh, ten gigabytes or something like that for this particular case. Um, so it's still great to have it in memory for fast, responsive uh, queries, uh, but um, you, you could load it basically from Parquet uh, once once you start your Shiny application directly uh, on on your your deployed server. Uh, that that was the point of it. Um, sorry about that. Uh, so is Parquet better than caching? <laughs> sorry about this again. Uh, yeah. So well, it, it depends, right? And uh, also, is there a quicker way to cache using Sparkly R? Uh, well, the fastest way to cache would be to put it in memory, and that's that's still desirable for a lot of uh, cases, right? Even when we write to Parquet, you would want to write it, uh, load it back into memory to get fast, responsive times with uh, with Shiny applications. Um, but um, uh, no, I mean, I think in general, Parquet is not better than caching, except for cases where you don't have enough memory, right? So uh, definitely, you know, if you don't have enough memory to cache all your data. Uh, uh, sa saving your um, your results as a parquet file also makes a lot of sense, right? Because it would save you 
computation. But um, in this in this particular example, uh, and again, the point was that if you're turning, if you're moving this to more of a, uh, uh, if you're building this application to share with your colleagues, for this particular case, you don't need to recompute everything all the time. You want to save it as a parquet file, then load it in memory each time that the, each time that the shiny application. Uh, each time that the uh, shiny server uh, starts for the first time, the shiny application, and then you're you're good to go. All right. Well, thank you so much. I believe that was the last uh, question. Thanks again, everyone that uh, that attended.